Okay, uh, we're gonna move on to part two here, Mosque Cathedral, Cathedral Mosque, and uh, our first uh, presenter with uh, Islamic Monuments and National Patrimony in Modern Spain is uh, Didi Fairchild Ruggles, Professor of Art, Architecture, and Landscape History at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She's the editor and co-editor of five volumes on themes such as visual studies, heritage, and women's patronage of Islamic art and architecture, and she's the author of two very well-known and award-winning books on Islamic gardens and a recently published anthology of primary sources on Islamic visual culture. Of course, I want to thank... Uh, I only have five minutes left already. Okay. Um, first, I want to thank, of course, Sheila Camby and um, Ava, and just reiterate what the other speakers have said, how, what a pleasure it is to be here uh, today at the, at the Met. Um, I'm going to do something that I normally wouldn't do, which is I'm going to actually um, give you a little bit of um, material that comes from something I've already published. I published it somewhere that I think very few people in this audience have seen, and I'm doing it not because I'm lazy, although I am a little lazy, but partly because I need to use it to set up the second half of the talk, or the second two-thirds of the talk. So the first part on the Great Mosque of Cordoba is material that was published a couple of years ago, but I want to use that as the jumping off point to talk about the Alhambra. Of course, both the Great Mosque of Cordoba and the Alhambra arguably two of Spain's greatest architectural monuments, both of them are places where nation-making occurs. It was, only once that they, it was only once they had ceased to function in their own time, either abandoned or repurposed, that they could serve national patrimony as signs that could represent something beyond themselves. In this case, as signs of a past that was very different from the present that now cares for them. When I teach the Mosque of Cordoba, and I suspect this is true of many of us in the room, I typically focus on the polychromatic double-tiered arcades and extraordinary mosaic mihrab, and I refer to the building as the Mosque of Cordoba. But it is, of course, actually known today as the Cathedral, the Catedral, because it has been in Christian hands since the conquest of Cordoba in 1236. In other words, it's really been a cathedral longer than it was a mosque. Interestingly, while it was taken over and used as a Christian place of prayer in that year, it was not architecturally transformed until 1523 when the architects of, 12, of uh, Charles V famously scooped out the center of the venerable mosque and inserted a Gothic cathedral choir so that the old mosque became the frame for the new cathedral. And ironically, this act of partial destruction is probably the reason why the mosque still stands at all, while those of other Spanish and Portuguese cities were demolished entirely. The historic chronology appears quite simple, with a nice parallel between political and architectural structure. As Spain shifts from Islamic to Christian rule, Cordoba's major monument is transformed from mosque to church. But neither the archaeological layering nor the political interpretation of this monument is really quite that simple. Because under the floor of the mosque cathedral, the traces of an even older Visigothic church are clearly evident. And here is where the problem of identity begins to emerge. Instead of a model of Iberian history that shows a clear shift from one order to another, the new archaeology, and there's really nothing very new about it, this new archaeology gives credence to the argument that the site where the cathedral now stands was always a church so that the conversion of the mosque to a church was not a progression, but a return. And there is a really wonderful exhibition uh, in the mosque that um, provides material evidence for this. The resultant model is quite different. Instead of imagining culture as always in the making, each historical period producing a cultural bequest to the one following, the new chronology can be used to insist upon an essential Christian presence. According to that model, the Grand Mosque is dismissed as a mere phase, an aberration that was ultimately corrected by the cathedral that eviscerated it. This perspective is very clear in the visitor's pamphlet that is the only tourist guide handed out at the site. Uh, it talks about a bed of hidden cathedrals, uh, and it kind of undermines the idea that the church, the Basilica of San Vicente, um, or it says that it was destroyed in order to build the mosque, and undermines the idea of 
tolerance. Obviously, this is written by some fairly bigoted um, priests, <laughs> which is not to say they all are, but... Medieval monuments, such as the Mosque of Cordoba, play a powerful role in the modern heritage politics of Spain. Because the interpretation of the medieval Iberian past, with its intertwining threads of Christian, Muslim, and also Jewish culture, is a deeply political act. Historians and art historians are usually at ease with those three cultural threads. But the pluralism is more difficult for Spanish politicians seeking to position the nation firmly within Europe, and more particularly, a European Union. And let's remember that this is a European Union that has resisted Turkey's bid for inclusion, partly, in large part, I would say, because it is a predominantly Muslim nation. For them, Spanish politicians, definitely for Spanish politicians, not for me, for them, to be Muslim connotes medieval, African, dark, tainted. But the reality is that Spain now has a number of Spanish converts to Islam and many immigrants who are Muslim. This undermines the earlier concept of national unity, where Spain's identity as a Catholic nation was enforced, literally enforced, by Franco. Franco's long gone, yet Spain still must manage its Muslim history carefully, not only by relegating it firmly to the past, but also by undermining its claim to originality by showing the true underlayer to be Christian. Of course, these kinds of arguments are merely rhetorical strategies, persuading us of a point of view rather than providing a set of unassailable facts. But whether as a rhetorical strategy or a set of facts, the original church, let's go back there, sorry, the original church idea doesn't work because underlying the 6th century Visigothic church, there was an even older Roman temple. The Romans can be claimed for Christianity, but when I teach my intro to Islamic art, and I suspect you all do too, I insist on Roman culture as one of the progenitors also of Islam. So now let's turn to the Alhambra. The Alhambra was a marvel in its own day, an enormous complex of colorfully tiled, intricately stuccoed halls, enclosing lovely gardens with running fountains, complemented by the adjacent Generalife Palace. Built as the residence of the last dynasty to rule Spain, it was conquered by Isabel and Ferdinand in 1492 and became the property of the crown. But few of the Catholic rulers ever did more than visit the place. And over time, the Alhambra was slowly divided up and variously given away, sold, and inherited by various members of the Spanish nobility. With the Napoleonic invasion, the site passed briefly and disastrously into the hands of the French from about 1808 to 1812. And they used it as a barracks and made all, many alterations to the built fabric of the place. And we know um, what many of these were. For example, Washington Irving, who resided in the Alhambra only 15 years after the French left, noted that the French had freely rebuilt the halls and gardens to suit their taste. Uh, specifically, he said they repaired the roofs, they cultivated gardens, they restored water courses. Uh, in particular, he noted that the French had planted a garden in the Court of the Lions, and that this had replaced, and I quote, its ancient and appropriate pavement of tiles or marble. Wait a minute. The Court of the Lions paved instead of gardened? This totally undermines everything I've ever written about the Court of the Lions. This is a problem. Indeed, prints from the era before the French occupation show the courtyard paved, not cultivated as a garden. I show you a 1779 print here, and there are a number made in 1660, 1665 by this guy. Now, I have to say this theory about the paving of the Court of the Lions, this is not my work. This is Eduardo Nuere in, um, in Spain, who's actually um, published this. But I want to push this um, in another direction. Um, I want to sort of examine the various phases of the Court of the Lions. Um, or I, or I should say, in my own work, I am examining the various phases of the Court of the Lions, and I'm not going to go into that here. Uh, instead, I want to kind of veer us back toward this topic of nationalism. Because regardless of the state of the Court of the Lions, and I have many opinions about that, the Alhambra has clearly suffered a great many dramatic changes, 
many other dramatic changes. For example, a large wooden ceiling was removed from the Partal Palace and eventually sold to a museum in Berlin. In fact, European and American museums are full of large and small objects from architectural elements from architectural elements to ceramic tiles and stucco fragments stripped from the Alhambra and either sold or given away as gifts. Yeah, that guy knows exactly what he's doing. Because the Alhambra and Generalife palaces were not fully owned by the state until the early 20th century, it was easy for visitors to roam around with a little bag and a little pickaxe. And Many of these, invis uh, these visitors not only took their impressions away with them, but many of them also left their marks. Victor Hugo, Chateaubriand, and Byron all left graffiti to commemorate their visits. Washington Irving installed himself in one of the towers of the Alhambra and hired carpenters to make the windows and doors more secure. When Théophile Gautier set up camp in the Court of the Lions, he put his mattresses alternatively in the Hall of the Two Sisters or the Abenteraje's Hall and put his bottles of sherry to cool where else but in the Lion's Fountain. These visitors to the palace experienced a piquant form of Orientalism in which the exotic was located close to home in Europe but emptied of its original inhabitants and thus available for repossession. Indeed, possession and imperialism were concepts performed on the, presences, on the premises, as we see in this 1893 photo of Spanish troops ready to defend the nation in the Rif War, a war waged against Morocco. How curious that Spanish troops would insist on their ownership of the Alhambra at such a moment. The photo of the poet uh, Jose Sorrilla on the occasion of being named Poet Laureate in 1889 is another moment of nationalist resonance and so on. The Alhambra has figured colorfully in the 19th century span, uh, historic imagination, and it continues to attract huge numbers of travelers interested in learning about places, times, and cultural perspectives, intellectual traditions different from their own. But the Alhambra has been preserved in a manner that insists on the past, denying the layers of later visitors. I've mentioned some of them, and we have images of them as well, from soldiers to artists to tourists to whoever these nut nutty people are who actually want to photograph themselves on the, on the lions. I mean, who doesn't actually, but... Not all of the people, though, at the Alhambra were mere visitors. The conservators of the late 19th and early 20th century also contributed to the architectural layers of the palace. They built a colorful cupola, in the Court of the Lions, which was subsequently removed, and a cupola in the Court of the Myrtles as well. And they dug the Partal Pool. Because we tend to see their work as restoring the site to an original state of authenticity, we overlook the hypothesis, the guesswork, the sheer fantasy of their interventions. In fact, they were so good at making their layers look authentic that ICOMOS and UNESCO in 1984 admitted the Alhambra and the Generalife together as a World Heritage Monument precisely because the complex was so well preserved, specifically for having escaped the vicissitudes of time. However, although the Alhambra may have appeared unstained by later history, there have been, in fact, a great many alterations to the, ar to the Alhambra's architectural structures and ornament and we've just glimpsed some of these. Beginning sometime after 1492 with the paving of the courtyard, and then the French restoration of a garden in the early 19th century, and in 1858 with the fanciful addition of a glazed tile dome over one of the projecting pavilions in the Court of the Lions. Historical change is inevitable. But it is disguised at the Alhambra where the early directors saw their role as one of restoring it to past glory, rather than simply stabilizing the structures. Because of their success in making the new look like the old, in fact, I think it's very hard to look at these two and not see the one on the right as the more authentic of them. But of course, that's, that's just literally impossible. Because of their success here in making the new look like the old, the experts who submitted the nomination to UNESCO saw the Alhambra as a window onto an intact past. Yet we know that the past is never delivered directly to the present, but comes through the filter of our ability to excavate, perceive, interpret, and imagine it. The 14th century Alhambra can only be known through representations. 
in the form of images, written descriptions, and even the palace itself, which we have seen was creatively reproduced by its conservators to recreate what they believed it must have looked like in its golden age. Although, how did they know? They had nothing to compare it to. So the palace that we visit today is a convincing, but not necessarily accurate, representation of its former self. In the modern age, a historic monument is a vehicle from memory. The great mosque of Cordoba and the Alhambra are monuments that allow us to reflect upon a fascinating age when world orders clashed. And this is important, Christianity won. That one-way street that Amanda was talking about. Buildings allow us to remember, but in national monuments, the memory has to be constructed in such a way as to contribute to, rather than detract from, the nation as project. And remember that the national project is still fraught in Spain, where Basque terrorists, at least when I was a graduate student, were still detonating bombs in public places. Catalan nationalists well, insist on the primacy of their native tongue, and lately they've been talking about seceding altogether. And more and more immigrants, many of them from northern Africa, most of them illegal, arrive, if they make it at all, arrive in search of jobs and then settle and try or fail to assimilate. The problem here, and this is the political context in which we have to understand this, the problem here is the relationship between nationalism and memory. In this case, how and why a professed Catholic nation remembers its Islamic past and specifically the tension that occurs when national identity, as emblematized in a major national monument, must balance between the celebration and repression of difference. In neither the Alhambra nor the Great Mosque of Cordoba am I offering to provide an authoritative assessment of the building's original state. Instead, I'm exploring how the expectations and values of each age shape the category of authenticity and how this authentic thing then becomes a tool for the construction of national identity. In Spain, we would do well to consider the present-day investments that underlie our interest in its past. We should ask, how can a modern nation that coalesced in large part to eject Islam look to that same Islamic past as the very thing that defines Spain and differentiates it from other European nations? In other words, as a key component of its modern identity. When past and present meet in this way, authenticity is asserted as a strategy to locate and fix the past in the past, lest it creep forward, as has occurred at the Mosque of Cordoba, and assert itself in the living present. I think that this strategy of asserting authenticity works at the Alhambra precisely because there is no longer much at stake whereas it does not work at the Mosque of Córdoba because it is a house of worship. The Alhambra was a palace easily converted after 1492 to house its new owners, the Christian kings. Palaces are easy to assimilate, and we have many, many examples of such assimilation, not only in Granada, but elsewhere in Spain as well. Just think about the Seville Alcazar. But the conversion of a church to a mosque, or a mosque to a church, is driven by much more than a taste for luxurious living. No matter how peacefully or non-destructively it was accomplished, it was not an assimilation, but a profoundly ideological change that although occurring in the medieval period, continues to reverberate in the present. Both the Alhambra and the Mosque of Cordoba are layered sites. At the Alhambra, authenticity is asserted in order to locate the palace in the past to, to uh, disengage it from the present. But that strategy doesn't work at the Mosque of Cordoba, where it is not authenticity that matters, but originality. The claim to originality does not simply insist on the past. It strips it away to locate the building at the right moment, which is Visigothic and Christian. So we've seen two examples that show how the present responds to the past as it selects which elements of history it wishes to engage with. And that's the model of culture always in the making. In Spain, there are many layers to choose from, and I find it interesting to observe which of the possible archaeological layers are selected at which moments in modern history, and how these begin to emblematize political positions. Furthermore, in its engagement with history, 
precisely because there is so much at stake politically, I would say that the present actively is constructing the past at these sites, both literally, as in the case of restorers who rebuilt many of the ruined halls and gardens of the Alhambra, but also conceptually, as at the Great Mosque of Cordoba, where history is called upon to provide the justification for present values and desires. Thank you. <laughs>